if the Hebrew language uh, in the centuries before the 16th century was only known by Jewish scholars and some rare Christian polymath, this situation changed drastically at the start of the 16th century. The Collegium Trilingue, which, uh, with which uh, you will be quite familiar by now, uh, in 1517 not only added Greek to the linguistic repertoire of serious biblical scholars, but also Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament. This holy language must have sounded quite outlandish for beginning students in Louvain, as the writing system, its phonology and grammar had very few parallels with more familiar languages like Latin and the vernaculars. Still, the first Hebrew lessons at the Trilingue were a huge success, and the concept of this trilingual academy was copied by other universities in Western Europe. Yet in these pioneering years, there was a dearth of Hebrew grammars and textbooks that were apt for students to use. The first grammar of Hebrew by Johannes Reuchlin, uh, De Rudimentis Hebraicis Libri 3, of 1506, was monumental but unsuited for classroom use. Text editions were also scarce and not always provided with the Latin translation. As such, the teachers of the Trilingue all procured their own Latin, uh, their own learning materials in, this, in these first years. The first teacher, Matthias Adrianus, compiled a short Hebrew alphabetum, which you see on the left, consisting in only one page in which the most elementary pronunciation and spelling rules were established. Johannes Campensis, who taught a few years after Adrianus, wrote his own grammar, although this was too dense for beginning students. Nicolaus Kleonardus, who was no official prof uh, professor, wrote the most influential of the Hebrew grammars at the Trilingue, which is the Tabula in Grammatica and Hebraia, published in 1529 by Thierry Martens. It benefited from the Hebrew lessons uh, Kleonardus received there, but also from his own pedagogical insights, so that the result was extremely useful to beginning students. These are all printed sources used at the Trilingue, but they cannot tell us that much about the learning ex experience of the students themselves. Those voice come from student notes within, uh, written in the margins of grammars and text editions, and can tell us which grammatical matter was treated, how the material was exposed, which points were focused on, etc. But student notes is a concept too vague to use efficiently, analyzing the diversity of primary sources for Hebrew teaching. So I propose in this paper to take a closer look at the different types of student notes we possess for Hebrew courses at the Trilingue. They are few and consist of two broad categories. First, there is a manuscript containing, uh, containing college notes, uh, naturally notes uh, not linked to a specific uh, printed text, which you see on the left. It is most likely that uh, this running text was dictated uh, by the then professor of Hebrew, Andreas Balenus. The other important source that can be linked without any doubt to the trilingue lessons in a small, is a small Hebrew Psalter uh, without Latin translation that is annotated by another student named Adrianus Vossius of Ghent. The source is to be seen on the right. This booklet uh, bears numerous annotations, uh, most consisting of only one single word. Other possible testimonies to the Hebrew lessons at Louvain are excellent, yet it cannot be proven with certainty that they stem from the Collegium Trilingue. These sources too can be attributed to one of these categories. The methodological, the methodological question I want to address in this talk is to what extent we can successfully compare these two types of student notes and what information they can offer us. More specifically, I will illustrate this on the basis of the important grammatical exercise of the setting Hebrew words to their roots. The first testimony to the Hebrew classes at the Trilingue are the college notes made by an anonymous student in the lessons of Andreas Genepius Balenus. The notes consist of two parts. One part is dedicated to a specific grammatical subject, namely the analysis of the inflected forms of the Hebrew root. This was no unimportant matter, as in Hebrew, many nominal and verbal forms receive prefixes and suffixes. As such, the original root is easily obfuscated for the beginning student who should be able to look up the word in a dictionary. The second uh, part contains an analysis of the first psalm. This analysis is by no means exegetical, that was the prerogative of the faculty of theology. As a consequence, the notes contain only remarks of a philological and grammatical nature. It is remarkable that every single word of the first psalm has been comment, uh, commented upon, sometimes with a translation and a brief remark, but mostly in quite an elaborate way. These college notes, uh, however, are not completely independent. Both parts should be interpreted together with printed texts. 
uh, the grammatical notes often refer to the Hebrew grammar of Johannes Isaac de Vita, which you see here on the right of the slide. Uh, more specifically, it's third edition of Cologne. Uh, Levita was for some time employed as Balenus teaching assistant. Uh, the grammar is said to be uh, to rely heavily on Balenus' own insights in Hebrew grammar, so much so that contemporaries suggested that Balenus was its actual author. The title of the notes itself, in fact, suggests that these notes should not be read independently from Levita's grammar. The, the difference with the grammar lies in the fact that the points treated in the college notes are spread all over the grammar, and Balenus clearly felt the need to present these coherently in one framework. It is possible that these notes on analyzing the Hebrew roots became an independent work, as Balenus is reported to have written a booklet uh, named De Investigando Thematis on analyzing the roots. Unfortunately, this work uh, never reached prints, and the original manuscripts also seem to be lost. As such, this could have been another familiar text to which a student knows were linked. The other part, uh, visually the grammatical analysis of uh, the first psalm, cannot be isolated from a printed edition of the Book of Psalms in Hebrew. Although every word of the psalm was written out in Hebrew, the use of and need for an independent edition becomes clear from a small note, which you see here. Uh, one, of the words, one of the words is marked by a biblical accent. These uh, accents were not word-bound, but acted more like uh, punctuation, unlike the Greek accents. Um, as such, there, these, uh, there should be, have been uh, one or more copies of the Psalms or the Hebrew uh, Old Testament that circulated in the classroom, like already suggested by Rafan Roy in the previous lecture, from which the students could copy the Hebrew words together with the appropriate accents. For Hebrew accents could not be heard, heard. Uh, there were no rules to apply them, uh, like in Greek, so they could only be notated when the student was using a printed biblical text. The student did not have the biblical text in front of him at the moment of writing down uh, a, Hebrew word, a Hebrew word. In that case, errors were easily made, like uh, some of uh, which are listed here. For example, the uh, Hebrew uh, negation particle is uh, written with a wrong letter, uh, which can confuse the advantage of this type uh, of type, uh, this type of source is that we come fairly close to the exact words of the professor, and thus can reconstruct this part of the curriculum. On the other hand, we cannot see how the students digested this raw material, uh, or which parts they felt uh, were more difficult and needed more attention. This information can only be distilled in part from college notes, uh, but our other source can offer more information on this aspect of the classroom teaching. The small Salterium Hebraicum, or Hebrew Psalter, edited by Sebastian Münzer and printed by Johannes Froben in Basel in 1532, was annotated by a student named Adrianus Vossius from Ghent. Um, and since his name figures, as you can see on the right, uh, in the metrical, um, in the, the uh, provenance notes, uh, and in the matriculation list of the Old University of Louvain, we can be fairly sure that the annotations in this book were written in the lessons of the Collegium Trilingue. Interesting, interestingly, the year when Vossius bought uh, the Psalter is mentioned in the book copy uh, of 1537, uh, which is situated within the professorship of Balenus. As such, we possess invaluable comparative material to the aforementioned college notes. Not only the first psalm has been annotated, but also the next ones up to Psalm 49. While in the first psalm, every uh, single word has been provided with a translation, as you can see here, um, the next ones are relatively sparsely annotated. Whether this is the case because of the professor only thought those annotated words interesting enough to be discussed, or whether it was a student who selected these specific instances, is not entirely clear. However, it is unlikely that the professor would have discussed only one word in a specific psalm. So this could in fact reflect an active filtering by the students. Does this source uh, offer as a different view on the image transpiring from the college notes? At first sight, the information contained by the brief remarks do not show many differences, as most of them are literal translations. But luckily enough, there are a number of annotations of grammatical nature, as well as annotations that explain textual variety in biblical realia. As you can see on the graph, the typology of student notes is thus more diverse, and suggested by the college notes. 
uh, which contains un almost exclusively grammatical remarks. Moreover, it seems that the students inserted personal notes on the psalm that were not dictated by the teacher. For example, uh, one psalm, Psalm 35, uh, bears the annotation elegans psalmus, or an elegant psalm, uh, which could have been a personal reflection of Vossius, although this cannot be entirely sure. A feature unique to, Vossius, uh, to the Vossius notes in Salterium Hebraicum are Hebrew accentuation marks added by the student to the printed text. They are not so easy to discern at first sight, but they are this, uh, those little handwritten marks added to the Hebrew words. Um, so these uh, stra accents, as I have already explained, uh, or uh, work on sentence level to indicate where the stress should be laid uh, and which words are pronounced in the same unit. Uh, the Hebrew Psalter annotated was printed in Basel by Van Schroben, but only the most important accents were printed in it. Uh, perhaps because it was a uh, beginning, uh, it was uh, printed for beginning students. It seems that Balinus paid a lot of attention to the theory of accentuation as the student wrote down minor accents too in the first psalms, suggesting that this was explicitly tre uh, treated in the lessons. If we only possessed uh, the college notes, this focus would have remained hidden. If we compare the analysis of Psalm 1 from the college notes with the annotations on the same psalm in the printed Psalter, the most useful information is offered in the psalm analysis in the college notes, since Bossius merely recorded the Latin translation of each single word in his book. However, one word in the Salterium Hebraicum is provided with a short grammatical explanation. It is the word ha'ish, the man in Hebrew, which needed an extra explanation because of the definite article ha, uh, which Latin is lacking. Both sources call it a nota emphasios, or an emphasizing mark. That the college notes uh, focus more on the formal aspect of Hebrew orthography. Uh, we would expect namely a doubling of the first letter of the word, which is marked by a point, the dagesh, in the latter. But since this letter is a guttural, doubling is avoided. Uh, while the annotation in the Psalter stresses the fact that it is a article uh, that expresses emphasis and not a question mark, it is also a point using the question, uh, using the particle how. This is an interesting outcome, uh, as we can possibly see how Balinus adapted his didactic style over the years. The Vossius Psalter dates from 1547, and the college notes were written in 1559. Although the differences, differences could also originate from the difference in focus. As for the other psalms, we can only guess at the differences, but the lack of information from the college notes on these psalms is filled in by the annotations in the, in the printed Psalter. These, in fact, do confirm uh, the attention granted to the exercise for discerning of the Hebrew roots. As explained earlier, the main focus of the grammatical part in the college notes was the emphasis, uh, was the analysis, uh, sorry, of our recognition of uh, the Hebrew roots. This issue was also made in the annotations in the Salterium Hebraicum, as uh, some 30 of the uh, 260 annotations are directly concerned with this exercise while most of the other annotations were mere translations. One needs to know that in Hebrew and other Semitic languages, uh, words have a root consisting of three consonants. Uh, nominal declensions and verbal inflections are formed by, modal, uh, by vowel, vowel modifications and by adding prefixes and suffixes. Sometimes one of these fixed root letters could disappear because of assimilation, and thus the root was not always clearly discernible. The pictures on the slides uh, show just some uh, forms of uh, marking uh, the original root. The methods uh, used to find uh, the root in the annotations reflect the theory established in the college notes in that some annotations indicate the prefix or suffix sticking to the root, uh, and some just offer the root without further comments. One example from the Psalter annotations may illustrate this practice. Uh, this uh, annotation, which reads uh, that the word ligdoshim uh, comes from the word kadosh, and the lamet, the l sound, is a prefix. Literally, it serves at the front. Uh, in the case when Vossius just wrote the bare Hebrew root, we can suppose that Balinus did not just dictate it as such, but formulated in a sentence equivalent to examples found in the college notes. Thus, this source can be uh, helpful to interpret the scarce information of the other one. Like 
and that's my conclusion. From this small survey, we can conclude a number of things. First, that stream nodes exist in various forms, each with their own advantages, disadvantages. And second, that these sources could not be studied in isolation, but rather as complementing each other. Information absent explicitly from the college notes becomes visible in the annotations, as is, for example, the case for the Hebrew accentuation marks. As such, the different sources enrich each other and establish a more complete picture of the didactic practices over the years. Using only one type of notes gives a rather limited view, and I'm lucky enough to have found this uh, Vossius Salterium uh, to enrich the alre uh, already existing image we had. On the other hand, the annotations in the Hebrew Psalter show where the stress was laid by the teacher or which expressions were regarded as difficult by the students, while on the other hand, the college notes dictated by the teacher rather show the intended curriculum, so to say, and, his, uh, and the teacher's didactic ideas. Moreover, these various types also reveal a different degree of processing by the students. The college notes show the exposition of the grammar through the lens of the professor, while Vossius seems, uh, seems to have applied his own filter, so to say. All in all, this could lead us to suspect a more inductive approach in teaching Hebrew, as the procedure of our two sources was reading psalms and annotating individual words in order to learn grammatical rules. Thus, we can, um, uh, we can manage to have a modest look into the Hebrew classroom of the mid 16th century Collegium Tulingue in Louvain. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Maxim, for this beautiful presentation. I'm looking to see if I can witness any hands being raised. Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, I don't quite know who was first. Um, ah, let's say, um, yeah, let's say Jesus. I really don't know. Second, anyway. Uh, thank you for such a paper. I was wondering, um, have you, because uh, um, I, I find it missing in, in, in your paper, but that can be your focus or perhaps because of the sources. Sorry. Um, have you compared the notes with the official curriculum? So that's the first question. And a very quick second one. By calling he Adrians, are you assuming that Matteo Adriani was Flemish? Um, to answer your first question, well, uh, the official curriculum is difficult to, um, well, to state. Um, Ralph already touched upon this question, I guess, um, in uh, his lecture. But uh, the testament of uh, Busleden was uh, prescriptive in nature. So the uh, information on what to read uh, in, uh, in uh, the Hebrew classes, um, well, is uh, limited. Uh, so to say, um, the, uh, the uh, goal was to read... Um, the biblical uh, authors, but there is not really a official curriculum to uh, compare it with. Uh, the second question, uh, well, uh, the uh, name of uh, Adrianus is just uh, pure con uh, purely conventional uh, chosen. Um, he was uh, Spanish descent, uh, so um, yeah, I guess uh, his name uh, in Spanish must have sounded uh, Mate uh, Mateo Adriano, but um, no, it's uh, just the Latinized uh, form of the name. Okay, and then we have a question by Anne, I think. Thanks so much. It's uh, triggered by your ending comments and also goes back to Raf, but maybe a comment for more people. To what extent are uh, teacher comments driven by student questions? My vision was always that the teacher came in, you know, as we saw with Politiano, he's got stuff to say and just, you know, goes through it. But, um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to think about interactive uh, opportunities uh, for deciding on the spot to comment on something. And I'm just curious if you have any evidence. It would be hard to see, obviously, but you know, mm -hmm. I asked or the te so and so asked or the teacher said. Anyway, just a thought. Yeah, that's a very interesting thought. Thank you for that. And uh, well, it is difficult to find hard evidence uh, to state that claim, but I don't think it's unlikely. Um, a large part of the annotations consists uh, in uh, transliterations of Hebrew words. Um, I can imagine the students uh, asked uh, the professor um, how this, word, this or that word sounded, um, because yeah, just uh, an annotation consisting of just a transliteration in Latin uh, alphabet of Hebrew words um, 
well, would have been difficult uh, to imagine that this teacher would have just uh, dictated like that, so to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think I saw a hand of uh, Asaf. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. That, that, that was fascinating. Um, I, this is just um, kind of curiosity. Uh, one of the things I've, I've, I haven't, I've never looked into seriously, but I'm kind of um, interested in um, is the question of pronunciation of, of, of the Hebrew pronunciation of uh, Christian scholars. And I think I've, I've never looked at this systematically, but the few kind of anecdotal cases I found, they're slightly later uh, grammars and textbooks um, in Germany. Um, uh, the transliterations make it very clear that they, if I'm not mistaken, that they pronounce Hebrew the Ashkenazi uh, pronunciation. So that kamatz would be an O, uh, a taf at the end of a of a uh, non-stressed syllable becomes a s, an S, and so on and so forth. It's kind of classic, which makes me think of how they pronounced Arabic or Syriac. Uh, uh, we know that Shikats, uh, um, when he transliterates his Arabic, uh, which he knew rather well, um, make some very kind of Hebrew, Hebrew-centric um, assumptions about pronunciation. However, some of the uh, the accent, I was fascinated that some of the uh, student notes, kind of um, accent notes, would would suggest a Sephardi pronunciation. Is that is that the case? Well, uh, the pronunciation is uh, certainly Sephardic. Uh, there is uh, no trace uh, of a uh, Ashkenazic uh, reading, so far as I know. Um, well, uh, the, uh, there are number, as I said, there are numerous uh, um, transliterations into Latin alphabets um, from which we can deduce uh, how it was pronounced more uh, the Sephardic way, uh, which would also have been the pronunciation of Mateus Adrianus, like uh, I reckon. Um, but there are some, um, well, uh, let's say um, remarkable conventions. Uh, for example, I remember uh, that uh, sometimes the uh, the sh sound of the shin is uh, translation tra is transliterated uh, with the combination of s uh, c like you would expect in italian for example uh, which struck me um, but uh, yes it's um, i will uh, it's uh, that's uh, for future work how to um, well how to uh, analyze uh, to uh, analyze the uh, pronunciation using the classroom because that is uh, also a very important uh, feature of uh, the whole dynamic of uh, teaching uh, Hebrew. Um, but yes, that's uh, all I can say for now. So yes, the, uh, the, uh, definitely the Sephardic pronunciation. Thank you. Okay, in fact, I had a small, small question uh, myself. I couldn't help but notice that um, those uh, college notes concerning Psalm 1 had the title Meditationes. And now, of course, I'm wondering if there's any connection with the Meditationes Graecanicae of our good friend, uh, Clenardus. Uh, not so far as I know, uh, no direct connection, that is to say. Um, but, um, well, yeah, it's indeed a very interesting title, Meditationes. Um, it's, uh, well, I like to imagine it as uh, meaning um, overthinking uh, the uh, first song. Uh, only apply to the the, anal the analysis of the first song, but um, yeah, it's an intriguing title. I cannot say uh, more about it. Uh, why it's exactly that uh, word which was chosen for the analysis of the first song, but in this. But if Clenardus uh, is uh, has something to do with it, uh, I don't know. I, I doubt. Okay, thank you very much.